fourth attempt to contest as a presidential candidate. Indeed, Muhammad Buhari has now emerged the president elect. In 2015, Nigerians voted for an opposition candidate against an incumbent for the first time in her 55 year history. I, Muhammad Buhari, do solemnly swear. General Muhammadu Buhari took the oath of office as Nigeria's sixth elected president. Republic of Nigeria, and that I will preserve, protect, and defend the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So help me God. I tried three times, 2003, I think 2007, and 2011. And I ended up in Supreme Court three times. It was evident that a lot had gone wrong from the beginning. Oil price fell to something like $34 or $28 a barrel at some point. The um, militants in the Niger Delta were blowing up uh, pipelines and other oil assets. So production actually fell to something like below 700,000 barrels. It was a very bumpy, I must, I must say, to put it as mildly as possible. We set up a transition committee to work with the outgoing government. They refused to work with us and uh, only insisted that they were going to give us handover notes on the 28th of May 2015. And that was exactly what happened. So until we took over the government, we didn't even really know uh, how bad the situation was in the country economically. I it was difficult. The infrastructure in Nigeria at that time had gone so bad. Nothing is working. The roads are terrible. No bridges, no railways. The airports have collapsed. Security architecture had gone bananas. Every aspect of governance had become so difficult. The image was too much to the extent that what was left in the coffers of the, of the SS crude account from $68 billion to $2.5 billion. It was the same time that we brought out the fact that the former Emir of Kano had written to the president to say $49 billion was missing from the coffers of an NPC. The country was in a disorderly state. The greatest challenge then was insurgency, and that insurgency was overrunning the country. The insurgency started in northeast. It moved into northwest. It moved into north central. It moved into the federal capital, Abuja. It had gone as far as Kogi, or as near as Kogi, to the southwest. After Kogi, where would we go? Southwest. If it overruns southwest, we are next, south south. And what is left of the country? You weren't sure that Nigeria will be there in the next couple of weeks. Nigerians have forgotten that in 2014, 2013, 2014, and part of 2015, hardly a day passed without one bomb exploding in one part of the country or the other. Most people would not want to spend the night in Abuja because Abuja was clearly one of the safest city in Nigeria then. The United Nations headquarters was bombed. The police headquarters was bombed. The Yayam market was bombed, um, some other supermarkets. As a matter of fact, I remember 13 local governments out of 20 in Banu State alone was under the complete control of Boko Haram. When I say complete control, I'm saying this is a situation where the Boko Haram had put, destroyed their own government, they fired MES, installed MES, collected taxes, and to all intents and purposes, they were in charge. People were not even able to come out to the mosques and churches to pray. People were not allowed to go to the markets. Um, in 2015, I was then a major general, I'm still within the Northeast in terms of my deployment. The situation in the Northeast then had deteriorated to such an extent that three major states in the Northeast, namely 
Adamawa, Bruno, and Yobi were at the heat of it all. The worst of them all was Bruno State, where about 17 local governments were under the red control of the Boko Haram terrorists. In Adamawa, you had about uh, three, two actually. Then the third one was just uh, partially. And then the same number, about two or three in Yobe State. In other parts of the country, you had, of course, the Niger Delta. But then, of course, coming out from the truce of uh, the militancy, and of course, the threats had not abated completely. But of course, we're making gradual progress. And of course, there were also issues of uh, some part of um, the Northwest that had a lot of um, issues too, with respect to banditry, you know, cattle rustling, among several others. And so this was where we were in 2015, security-wise. Now, these were just the domestic issues we met on the ground, but there were other associated threats coming from outside Nigeria. The most immediate was the emerging threat, eastern neighbor Cameroon, with the secessionist agitation by the Amazonians in the Anglophone part of Cameroon. And they were already shifting into Nigerian territory. They had already infiltrated about 11 states of Nigeria. There was also a threat coming in as a fallout of the situation in Iraq and Syria. When the terrorists and the insurgents were flushed out of those two countries, then these criminal elements in turn started moving southwards into the Sahel and their ultimate destination was Nigeria by virtue of the fact that Nigeria had a very large population and it had the largest economy. The image of Nigeria was uh, at a very, very low ebb. There was the uh, unfortunate event of the Chibok girls that had really captured the imagination of the world. Like millions of people across the globe, my husband and I are outraged and heartbroken over the kidnapping of more than 200 Nigerian girls from their school dormitory in the middle of the night. The Nigerian global brand was very, very seriously tarnished. There was a scandal, about 20 billion US dollars that was missing. And when we came in, in 2015, 27 states out of 36 could not pay salaries. It took this President Mohamed Buhari, irrespective of your party affiliation, to give what he call budget support to all the states. I think the key thing for me as an individual was I thought the country had reached unfathomable levels of corruption in the last administration. You know, you had public sector, police, uh, government workers not being paid salaries and allowances. You know, you even had the, the federal government providing um, bailouts to different states of the federation. Nigerians were not happy with the government in 2014 in the run-on to the 2015 general elections. They felt that the economy was badly handled. They felt security was a major concern. And um, they felt that the government was not doing a good job with tackling corruption. Even the government that was leaving uh, had predicted that the economy was heading into a recession. In 2016, we went into a recession. This recession lasted three quarters. In the fourth quarter, we exited recession. The economy was very much dependent on import of food items, especially rice. Rice was costing the country a lot in terms of imports to the country. So we set out to stabilize the economy, to rein in inflation. And after he took on the oath of office, and he said, Governor, what are people importing? And I said different things. So people import rice, people import 
Mais, people import toothpick, people import cement, people import different things. He said, but well, you are, if we're importing all these things when we can produce them in the country. I said, unfortunately, sir, that's where we are. He said, no, but we shouldn't be importing what we can produce in the country. We shouldn't be importing what we can produce in the country. Mr. Governor, I am interested in growing the agricultural base of this country. I have at least close to about 14 to 16 million people who voted for me. These are the masses. And I would like you to concentrate on how to grow agriculture, particularly for our smallholder farmers, our farmers in the village. These are the people that voted for me, and I would like to, to bequeath to the country a legacy where those who voted for me, even when I'm leaving office, will be happy that I was here, that they enjoyed the dividend of democracy under me because at least they were able to have access to cheap credit for them to engage in their agriculture or farming activities. He said, well, I would love to see a situation where we're able to do something for these smallholder farmers in our rural communities because we need to improve the wealth in our rural communities in the country. In the last quarter of 2016, President Buhari invited us through his chief of staff, the late chief of staff, uh, Malang Abakari, invited me, especially as the president, in, the, in a meeting with the two of them to see how can availability of fertilizer be in the country and affordable. That was their concern and the challenge of the foreign exchange in the country. I remember saying to, uh, to the president, if he has the guts to do what we're going to ask him, what I'm going to ask him to do. And his chief of staff, late Malan Abakari, blessed memory, said, how can you ask a general if he has a God? I said, I knew generals that they didn't have a God to do that. He said, like who? I said, like um, the former head of state who, who will not touch anything to do with revolutionary of the fertilizer. But he said, you are a full animal, you can do it. We gave him the template of how to revolutionize the agricultural sector. We have 11 blending plants in the country. Can we get them up and running? And can we get the raw material that we don't have in the country? We have to import 37% of raw material, potash and uh, phosphate. Phosphate from Morocco, potash from uh, Belarus in the Balkan. So, and he said, let's do it. And I said, how fast does he want this to be done? He said, like yesterday. The aim is to make sure that we grow what we will eat and eat what we grow. Nigerians, before they depend on the importation of rice from Taiwan and other places, but Nigerians are now exporting rice. And there are people who left air conditioned offices, went back to the land, and they haven't regretted it. So really, the campaign we conducted in asking Nigerians to be self-reliant, we have the land, we have the resources, we have the people, then why should we depend on anybody to feed us or to do any favor to us? This is one of 10 rice mills across the country that the government is constructing. This is all to increase agricultural productivity uh, in the country, especially rice. Uh, we have done so much in rice. This particular administration has done so much uh, to the point that Nigeria is the number one producer of rice in Africa. Yes. This is white maize. Very good, yeah, yeah, that's good. Nice grains. Yeah, it's, uh, the season uh, ended in uh, the fact that we have achieved food security is very important. And again, uh, people underscore that, but we are a population of 210 million people. And if a government is not able to enable its people to feed itself, then there's a problem. Because it will be very difficult to continue to live on importing food. 
if we have to import food for the large population that we have, then we won't be able to do anything else because all the money will go in food. But what he's done is enable people to actually farm. Farming became a business and people are now making very good returns. Today, the world is suffering from a major food crisis. The fallout in the Russian-Ukraine war has been felt more in the kitchens and around the dinner tables globally. President Buhari's drive to make agriculture a driving force in Nigeria's economy has spared Nigeria, a country of over 200 million people. Nigeria is not only able to feed its population, it is also exporting food to other countries. If you depend on somebody for your two or three meals a day, then you are in trouble. The same thing to a nation, any nation that depends on anybody to provide either food or security for that nation, then that nation has compromised its uh, independence and its integrity. What we want and what we tell Nigerians is that they must be self-reliant. They have the land, they have the resources. One of the challenges we have in the past because the utilization of fertilizer per hectare, we have the lowest. And the global practice is between 200 to 300 kg per hectare. And in Africa, we're doing between eight to 20. The Nigerian was in the bracket of eight kg per hectare, which means your yield, the yield for the farmer is very low because of lack of utilization of availability of enough fertilizer by his stretch farming. But with this revolution that was done, today I can mostly tell you the farmers have moved to average of 200 kg per hectare. It has increased the yield and that's the result of why you see the ban of, of importation of rice and some agri-commodity because we are now attaining to being self-sufficient to that production. That has put more money to the farmer. That have increased. Agriculture has become a business instead of a development in the country. So these policies have helped in uh, revolutionary agriculture. And I'm working with the central bank governor in this program on the Anchor Borrowing Program, where they support the farmers with soft loan. Almost 15 million farmers are enjoying this facility and the inputs. Today we've grown our Cobra program to a point where we are doing 21 different agricultural crops today. Rice, maize, sorghum, even palm oil. We are doing different products. Cassava. Because these are smallholder farmers, they're always having uh, financial challenges. And we're going to develop a special program where, rather than give them money to go and buy the farming input, or Greek input, that we will give them high yield seedlings. We will give them fertilizers. We give them other agricultural inputs. From where they take those to go and farm. When they finish farming, we don't even wait for them to sell. We put up a program where we recover the maize or the cassava or the paddy from them. And we have our own arrangement where we sell to recover our loans. This is a novel idea that we developed. And I must say it worked. Today, I would say that we are self-sufficient in rice production. We increased the number of fertilizer blending plants from five to over 50 today. We've created jobs. On the Anko Bura program, we've lent over one trillion naira to over 4.5 million direct 4.5 million smallholder farmers. We've cultivated over 6 million hectares of land. Those are extremely good initiatives that have yielded good results. And Nigeria is self-sufficient in food that we don't have to import food to be able to feed our people. So for anybody that is importing food, they're doing it as a matter of luxury, not as a matter of necessity. No government, no administration in the recent past that has put more money, that has put more money in particular in the hands of smallholder farmers. No one has diversified the economy using agriculture. 
than this particular administration. Young people in this administration are coming into farming more than in the previous administrations. In his previous three attempts at the presidency, one group had believed in Buhari and stayed with him. They are the forgotten in Nigeria, the poor who only matter during elections. As president, Buhari decided they would be his priority. Looking at the levels of poverty, looking at levels of unemployment, it was evident that we needed to do something that would, to a certain extent, ameliorate the, the levels of poverty, unemployment, etc. There are two major challenges we are confronted with. One is that of poverty. It was extraordinary in the land, forbidden. And then the first recoveries, I'm talking of financial recoveries that was made by President Muhammad Buhari, was that of $322 million recovered from Switzerland, asset recovered. And President Muhammad Buhari now took a decision to ensure the deployment of the $322 million into alleviating the poverty that was prevailing in the land. And that was what gave rise to social investment program. The end power, the school feeding, the public works, the small scale enterprises support, and a host of other social investment programs. We started with 200,000. By 2018, we had a batch B of 300,000, making it 500,000. Out of this 500,000 that we have exited uh, in, in 2021, most of them, about 109,000 of them, have become entrepreneurs. They are now employers of labors on their own and they are doing very well. After my NYC in Kevin State, I came back to Abuja where I reside. So I didn't have any job. I heard about uh, Empower when the federal government established it. And I applied. I got it. We've been trained. After training, we are giving, every month, we are being given some stipend of 30,000 Naira. I'm Empower Stream A, because they have about three badges now. I'm badge A. I was able to establish myself. I have a registered company. This is our farm. We also have one in Kubwa, but because I'm closer here, so I decided to bring you to this uh, Kabusa part. This is, we just invested last week. If not, you would have seen some people coming to buy. All these people that are roast fish around, they come to buy. Right? You have the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the head, the, the hand, the leg, right? The full body like this. So, I currently run Ledwin Adult Education, based in Jabi Abuja. Before I joined Empire, I've been working in the private uh, primary school, a secondary school, and of course, all of us understand that when you get to, when you work in the primary schools, you get underpaid. Empire has actually helped me to get these things done uh, on my own to push my vision outside. So without Empire, I wouldn't be where I am today. Empire opened my eyes a lot of opportunity, which I could not have seen with that empire. By God's grace, I have uh, 12 co-workers, staff that work with me to run this pro project together. And we have been doing this. We have three permanent centers in Abuja. We have another one in Besa Airport Road. We have another one in Masaka, Nasarawa State. In Aya ni nake karban keken din a wata ina biya to da da ba a ba mu wannan tallafin ni da miji na noma yake kama muna shan wahala yara mu kama da yake ba su zuwa makaranta ma saboda ba kudin da zamu biya musu makaranta gaskiya a da kam muna sha wahala da rashin lafiya idan aka rashin lafiya ka yadda zamu samu kudin mu ka asibiti da yanayi abincin kamun da muna ya kare rani ya kare sai mun saya abinci da ke dake to amma yanzu da aka fara ba mu wannan tallafin abun yayi sauki muna dan samu muna shi kuma muna dan yara musu na dan makaranta babban kan muna dan biya mishi yana karatu kana nan ma dai dukan su dai uku ka na samu kuma ana kawo min dinki gasuna 
wannan din dinki ne ana kawo me da muka samu dan kafi 30 ya shigo to muna noma kamar dawa nan sai mu samu kamar buhu hudu ge dana sai mu samu kamar buhu koma muna samu rogo muna samu mai yawa kadi yanzu kan and our main focus is on the ordinary citizens of this country people who are below the economic pyramid people who have been affected by one form of disaster or the other. We feed children every day, primary school children, primary one to three. We are feeding about 9.8 million children now. And that also runs to billions of Naira on a monthly basis. The conditional cash transfer that we support poor and vulnerable households with 5,000 Naira every month, we are supporting almost 2 million, about 1.9 million households with this 5,000 Naira. That also runs into billions of Naira on a monthly basis. It is unprecedented. It has never happened, honestly. And all in a bit to see that People are being supported, people are being catered for, people are being uplifted out of the status they are in. The homegrown feeding is through most local agriculture, that's uh, local production, food production. Secondly, it also creates jobs at the local community level. When there was a morning, the president called me. This is after about a year and a half of the program. He said, you know, that he was listening to the, I believe it was the BBC service. And he said he was struck by the fact that there were two young men from Bauchi State, I recall, he said they were from Bauchi State who were interviewed by the BBC. And they said, look, we got this, we, we applied, we heard that there was end power, we applied. We didn't know anybody, we didn't know any senator, we didn't know anybody. We applied and we were, given a chance to be on it, we were, we were employed and we've been paid month by month. We are teaching in a primary school and this. I said, he said, he said he was, yeah, he said, oh, so we must thank Baba Buhari for this. And he said to me, he said, you know, this is really, like, it must be very, very impactful. With the recession behind it, it was time to build on the gains of his first term as the president's second term began. Then, an enemy the world never saw coming crippled the globe. The World Health Organization has now confirmed what many epidemiologists have been saying for weeks. The coronavirus is a pandemic. There are now more than 120,000 known cases in 114 countries. I was part of a, a group of global experts and we were brought together by the World Health Organization to go to China and by that time, you know, the, the outbreak was already a mature outbreak in China when they had shut down the entire country, especially the Wuhan uh, province. The first thing that struck me when I got to China was uh, um, what it means to lock down a country as big as that. Well, there were two thoughts. First of all was the speed and uh, the ease with, with which this uh, virus was spreading around the world, which was terrifying. And uh, the second was the strengths and weaknesses of our own health system. How do we cope with this uh, challenge? President Muhammad Buhari has set up a presidential task force for the control of the coronavirus 19 disease, otherwise known as COVID-19, with the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, as chairman, while Dr. Sani Aliyu is the national coordinator. So we put heads together and we've quickly realized that this is not something we could just rely on our our traditional voices and means of communication and we really had to bring in everyone. Okay, so there's no need to be wearing face masks because obviously there's no COVID, like look around. I don't believe COVID-19 because COVID-19 does not exist in Nigeria. Everybody thought that, okay, this is another scam, elitist scam to steal money. This is their disease. But with persistence and determination, we were able to begin some communication with the Nigerian people. And they began to adopt and even respect and oblige the non-pharmaceutical measures that we put in place. 
The booster dose of the COVID-19 vaccine was administered on President Muhammad Buhari by his chief personal physician, Dr. Suhaib Sanusi Rafindadi, though devoid of any formal ceremony. We did set up a private sector group that we called COVID Coalition of Private Sector Against COVID-19. We taxed Nigerian private sector and banks. We, I think we were able to raise almost close to about 40 billion naira. No country in the world had private sector people coming together to think of what can we do to support our people, not just government, our people, to ensure that people don't die, to ensure that we can even help them. To, we, we did two things. All over the country, we built health centers, we brought in drugs, tents were built in 36 states of the country. And as of today that I'm talking, we have the best molecular laboratory in the country. We deployed a lot of money, we stood up a laboratory, we bought all the facilities. The last plane, the last flight from Turkey before the lockdown brought all the equipment we needed. And this is one of the molecular labs that was set up to help in the combat of COVID-19. The molecular laboratory, since its inception, the primary aim has been the detection of SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. But it also has other functions like the qualitative and quantitative detection of other diseases like hepatitis B, C, and HIV. We started to increase the capacity to diagnose more laboratories, more reagents, and uh, at that time planning to set up more isolation centers. So okay, this is the uh, infectious disease molecular laboratory and uh, also infectious disease general laboratory. On reflection, you know, the, the Nigerian government does get a lot of flack for, for many things, right? But I think on this particular occasion, um, you know, I'm really proud of the steps taken by our political leadership very early on in the outbreak. Deliver content to students at home through television, through internet sometimes. So the federal government has done that even though it is not in its line of duty. We, we found ourselves as the entry point of COVID, naturally the airport. So the first we did is to alert government that, look, we need to close down these airports. The protocols we developed in Nigeria, you know, were shared with the world, and most of it, you know, was adopted. We took our job very seriously. And that's why when um, airlines from countries of, I think, KLM from uh, Netherlands, Air France from France, uh, Lufthansa from Germany, British Airways from Britain, Emirates from UAE, and so on, Oh, they flouted our rules uh, against COVID. We didn't wait a second. We just suspended the airlines at that time. And luckily for us, they saw the reason and the rationale. They apologized. So British Airways, Lufthansa, Air France, uh, all uh, came back the next day. Uh, the expectation of the world was that they were going to be picking dead bodies on the continent of Africa, on the streets. Uh, but we proved them wrong. I believe it's our resolve and our determination as a country and as a continent to fight uh, for our lives. You know, uh, particularly in Nigeria, you know, we love life. Nobody wants to die. Uh, we knew it was an all of government approach that was necessary. But in addition to that, we also got the corporate world to come into the response. So it was all of people approach. And uh, our national response was crafted in such a way that everybody had a stake in it. We were all on the same page. That COVID period also helped us to make comprehensive assessment of the healthcare system in the country. And with that assessment, we were able to now refocus funding that was supposed to have served other sectors to key 
health infrastructure in the country. So you have uh, in every state at least one federal medical center or one tertiary hospital that has been fully upgraded because of the COVID-19 and the resources that were able to mobilize very, very quickly to attack the pandemic and not allow it to seep in and dilapidate our people. We noticed that we have high rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality. And for us to, to reduce that to the barest minimum, we have to intervene. It is a critical intervention. Critical intervention to save lives. Life of the baby and the life of the mother. And we embarked on building mother and child center in almost all the states of the Federation. So we have it 120 beds and we have 100 bed hospitals fully equipped and handed over to the state government. And those hospitals come with a hybrid inverter, a solar inverter, so inverter to power the hospital for them and we provided them with another source of electricity so that if they don't need to use that, we use inverter. This is a model, a newly designed model of a primary healthcare center, the foundation of the healthcare system in Nigeria. We are going to have one of these type in every political ward of the country. That will be nearly 10,000 units and supposed to attend to the needs, health needs of up to 70% of the population with the basic minimum package of healthcare. The federal government under the leadership of President Buhari appropriated what we call the 1% of the basic health of uh, consolidated revenue of the federal government to drive service delivery in here. And it's going to be supported by National Health Insurance uh, Agency or scheme to fund delivery of uh, minimum package. The devastation caused by this situation has destroyed many lives and livelihoods and is clearly a driver for the reason why many people in that region have lost faith in government, resorting to many criminal activities we are seeing in the region today. Before we came on board, you can't fish in Ogone land because the rivers have gone very oily. The fishes have died. Most of the cultivatable lands are oily, right? There are no visible effort, you know, to support the livelihood of the people. You could see clearly that there is despondency. There is so much loss of faith, the people of Ogoni land. Now, We've been able to train a lot of youths, a lot of youths under the level program and women, either in a lot of crafts and uh, vocations. Uh, for instance, some of them have been trained to be seafarers, some have been trained to be ship technicians. You know, we've just gone beyond the normal training of people just training people for POP or whatever. No, we are training them uh, in aviation industry in the shipping industry so that they can be productive to themselves and to the society. You've heard of the hybrid hydrocarbon pollution remediation projects uh, uh, which the federal government also put in place for the cleanup of Algoni. That is not a project to be done in one day. Uh, it's a long-term project, 25 years, 35 years but it's ongoing and it is the, this current administration that took the bull by the horns uh, to make sure that that structure was put in place to drive it. It is perhaps one of the biggest clean up project in the world of its scale and magnitude. The people are happy. Areas land that were uninhabitable or not cultivatable before his coming today are enjoying their land cultivating, using their land as marketplaces, 
and other things. So Ogoni Cleanup is a big project. Even the UNEP is happy with the kind of uh, focus and support that the president put in that place. We also have uh, the amnesty program, uh, which has been running. Thousands of youths uh, from the region have been trained and empowered and resettled. And, and that has also helped in ensuring that uh, we have peace in the region. Because youths who were involved in uh, acts of uh, militancy, uh, piracy uh, in the past, were given an opportunity to, for rehabilitation and to reset their lives. And that policy too has paid dividends. Uh, when this president took over, he met an industry that is uh, staggering to, to operate. Decision makings were difficult. Decision make, decisions are made on the basis of uh, personal considerations. And the meaning of this is that you now have assets in the hands of people who cannot properly run those assets. And the ultimate reason is that we are at a principle of collapse. The biggest problem we had then was actually the lack of um, commitment by the IOCs. Um, of course, we've been trying to push the PIA for over 20 years. And that's the Petroleum Industry Act, which eventually became the Petroleum Industry Bill. And this brought about a lot of uncertainty in the industry. But with that being cleared, and I mean, this is one of the greatest things in the oil sector, because what it does is that it has given way for clarity, transparency, and potential investment. Because now we're going to see a lot of gas infrastructure, a lot of gas development, and that will obviously bring about more power, more industry, more pet chem, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we know gas is a transition fuel. So this ex will be extremely useful for the global space in terms of clean energy, clean fuel, and the future. Let me start by welcoming respected and invited guests from across the world to the historic residential unveiling of the NNPC Limited. This is a landmark event for the Nigerian oil industry. Our country places high premium in creating the right atmosphere that supports investment and growth to boost our economy and continue to play an important role in sustaining global energy requirements. Now you have a company that is a limited liability company governed by a new set of laws called the Petroleum Industry Act. And the meaning of this is that this company must declare dividend to its shareholders it must act like just any other private company. It must also compete with its peers in the industry, in the entire energy sector. So what it does is that it will deliver more dividend, more efficiently, more positively to its shareholders. And of course, these shareholders are the 200 million Nigerians. The whole idea is for us to really overhaul and give the oil industry a complete makeover and open up new opportunities in the oil industry. We believe that the easiest way to diversify Nigeria's economy is still within the oil and gas sector. From gas, you can get fertilizer, which will open up your agricultural sector. From gas, you can also get the petrochemicals, and you can also open up a lot of factories. From gas, you get methanol, and you can also enable the pharmaceutical and chemical businesses. From gas, of course, you can have power. Now, as a private limited company, albeit owned by the government, it will be able to raise money in, um, in the international markets and be able to get into sort of joint ventures and sort of 
that it was not able to do, attract the kind of capital it should. And most importantly, um, inherit the sort of corporate governance, which encourages global investment flows to come into the corporation, well, a limited liability company right now, as a um, veritable platform for harnessing oil and gas resources. The word transform is an understatement. I would say it is going to lift off, it's going to explode, it's going to, you know, it's, it's the greatest thing that has happened to this because what it does is that it brings reality to the fiscal policies in industry. It also ensures that people can invest in the midstream. Any development in any sector, if the developments are not affecting the macro and microeconomics, it's a waste of time. Because what happens is that you just have export of value and no intrinsic value. But with the PIB as it is, the midstream, which is the gas, the pet cams, the refinery, which affects the local economy, it's all there. But our target is to be the energy company of choice. And that is beyond oil. Uh, beyond the realities of today. And we know that while Africa and Sub-Saharan African countries will continue to rely on fossil fuel for uh, many of our transportation system, running our infrastructure and so on. Uh, but we also know that with access that we have, you know, this company can grow and become bigger than anything. Why is it Nigeria there is no power? There is power. Right? But the best uh, question you should ask, why is it that power is not enough in Nigeria? But if you compare us with other countries, you may be even better than them. But our size may also give us away. Because for a country with 200 million population and a GDP of close to 500 billion dollars with only the electricity hovering around 5,000 megawatts. You may say we are not doing well. We set a roadmap for the country to deliver first increased electricity output. The medium term strategy was stable electricity and the long term plan was uninterrupted power. And I think that we had made a lot of progress in terms of increasing the supply of electricity because people used to feed back to us then that their electricity supply was predictable. If it was not yet uninterrupted, they could plan. They knew when the outages were likely to happen, which was different from the past. And that their consumption of diesel and petrol to provide alternative electricity generating facilities for themselves had significantly reduced because our supply was getting better. And uh, I think that the taste of the pudding, as it says, is in the eating. So those who experienced those days will better tell you how they felt. But those are the feedback that we got in relation to the objectives that we set up. One of the president's key goals was to stabilize power in Nigeria. At the onset of the COVID pandemic in 2020, his chief of staff, Malam Abakiari, set off for Germany to meet with Simmons about bringing Nigeria out of darkness. Malam Kiari contracted COVID and passed away. But his supreme national sacrifice means Nigeria can start dreaming of better power supply again. He has worked so hard to see the semen intervention concluded. Well, we continue with the, with the process even after him. So I went to Berlin. I went and met with the president of semen, Chris Tambrook. We met in Berlin. I toured all their sites. I saw everything. So I went and chased the delivery. That's led to the ones we have installed at Apple, Lagos. Because by then, Nigerians not understanding what is going on with semen. Semen, semen. Everywhere I go, they will ask me semen. And they say, this semen, 
every time we have electricity problems, say, ah, this cement is not true. Now it's showing Nigerians that cement is real. The PPI is real and uh, we are going to deliver, inshallah. It's already in Apo here in Abuja. It's already in Aja in Lagos. And uh, uh, some of the equipments are uh, already in our ports, being clear uh, on the high sea. In the whole of Africa, there's not one single African entity or country that has managed to privatize the power sector. When this action was taken by the last government, everyone said it was going to fail. Even when this government came in, the issue was that, oh, it didn't seem right. But the conditions under which those who took over were unbelievable conditions. But that doggedness of we must succeed has allowed some to survive and allowed some to die also because where they haven't been able to succeed. But what the government did, you know, initially was there was this sense of how do we get these things right? Now it became a sense of we must get this right. And then intervention came in. And through that intervention, you've seen a lot of progress. It takes years to build infrastructure. It takes years to correct the rot that was there, which we all inherited. It's definitely improved. I wouldn't say that we're at Utopia, um, but there's been, um, now Nigeria has about 15,000 megawatts of installed capacity. You know, the uptake is quite low, 5,000, 6,000 odd, I think. Um, we're going to see very soon an uptick in power consumption. We produce over 20% of the electricity that's consumed in the country. And um, um, so far, I feel that there's certainly been an improvement if you look at the statistics, but you will find the bulk of that improvement will come over the next five years. I mean, there's no reason why if the nation with commitment shouldn't see, you know, in 24 electricity over the next 10 years, if you ask me. But we must see that progress. The man on the street, he doesn't want to think about light. He wants to know that when he gets home, there's light. But then again, the big question we must always ask him, is he willing to pay for that service? Because we cannot in one breath deliver that service without cost-reflective tariff. One can argue that without vandalism, Nigeria would be further along in her development. It's been a case of the government pulling the country two steps forward and vandals dragging us five steps back. Vandals disrupt most sectors of the economy, from transport to aviation, but especially in oil and power. The system collapse that we used to experience is close to like 20 times in a year. That is showing how unstable and how weak the national grid was. But 2021, throughout 2021, we had only two partial system collapse on the grid. And that is showing that the grid is getting stronger. Recently, we experienced three system collapse in 2022. This was not due to the weakness or, or whatever of the grid. It is due to the fact that there was a vandalized pipeline that takes gas to one of our plants. And suddenly the plant has to shut down and that causes the instability around the whole grid. Some vendors went and cut off the, 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 the tower of a 330 line. And that also sent the, the, the shock around the grid and the grid collapses around evening time that day. Until we inculcate the attitude of change in Nigerians and begin to resuscitate our value system and begin to get Nigerians to believe that, they must embark on immediate attitudinal change, putting country first and begin on a massive re reorientation campaign and engagement of the citizenry we will not achieve the full change, but that change is achievable when you and I believe that this Nigeria is ours to own and we collectively own it. I had an occasion to speak to leadership of people from the South South. You know, this interference with the infrastructure, 
and I told them that uh, if you go and blow a firefly, or you sabotage the oil well head of the well producing oil, you pollute the environment. I said the area you people are that are claiming this petroleum uh, product, the fish goes back into the sea. The rest of the area is, is polluted. You cannot farm, you cannot fish. And the majority of your people, as I was telling them, are farmers and fishermen. So you are furnishing your own people more than the rest of Nigeria. I hope they have seen the sense in that. I don't know whether they still ask these questions in primary school nowadays. It's a very, very good exam question. Who is the government? The answer is we are the government.